all right, if I go in and I say X, Y, Z, and I do X, Y, Z, they're going to refer their customers to me and not the hundred guys that have pitched them before. And <clears throat> that made a massive difference for me. So um, 2019, I ended up doing almost 5 million in, in roofing sales. You know, they're sale, these agents are salespeople, right? They usually even hire people to do the customer service aspect. They're not doing the adjusting. They are, they are purely sales. Right. More so, more so than a roofing salesperson as a salesperson. Um, that's all that they are doing. And if you can not only help them keep the customers that they have, but you can bring them new business, you win. What's up, advocates? Welcome back to another episode of the Claims Game Podcast. I'm your host, Vince Perry, owner and CEO of Elite Resolutions and the Commercial Claims Advocate. Today, we have a very special guest, somebody I've been trying to get on the show for a very, very long time because he has a very unique system, a very unique marketing system where he doesn't target contractors, he doesn't target homeowners, he doesn't target other people that you may not you know, that you normally target, he actually targets insurance agents. And he's got a whole system and a whole framework as to how to get insurance agents to start referring you claims. And I know you're thinking what I'm thinking. I have never received a referral from an insurance agent, or maybe you have. I know in my 15 years career, 15 year career, I could probably count on one hand how many referrals I've received from insurance agents, but he has a very unique way of doing so. So it's a very interesting podcast today with Matt Danskin, who's the owner at Restoration Referral System. And he's got a referral system bootcamp that he basically breaks down the entire way of call, cold calling agents, finding local agents, and basically pitching them to start having them refer you business. So it's a very interesting podcast. I hope you enjoy it. Take a look now. Claims Game Podcast coming at you. Welcome to the Claims Game Podcast with Vince Perry. Get all the tips you need from insurance claim advocates and professionals and grow your public adjusting career to the next level. And now the commercial claims advocate, Vince Perry. Okay, okay, okay. We are back for another episode of the Claims Game Podcast. And I'm very excited about this one because I have been trying to get Matt on the show for a very long time now, but it's because of me and me canceling on Matt, I believe on three separate occasions that we have not been able to get him on the show. But I am very proud to announce that we have Matt Danskin, owner of Restoration Referral System. Matt, thank you for coming on, man. Additional living expenses is one of the most difficult parts of an insurance claim. And the reason is, is it's very high pressure. And as a public adjuster or contractor, you're already dealing with the negotiating of the build back process. You don't want to have to deal with ALE as well. Black Diamond Housing Services does all of that. They don't even charge the client. They bill it directly to the insurance company. It's all covered under the ALE coverage. So you need to call Black Diamond if you have a house that has been severely lost, whether it's like severe mold, severe water, fire, or anything like that, where they need a place to stay, Call Black Diamond Housing Services and they'll be able to take care of your client from beginning to end. Everybody needs an attorney on their side. So whether you're a public adjuster or contractor or anyone else in the insurance claims business, make sure that you have an attorney that you could rely on, that you can go to for questions whenever you need it. That guy for me for the last 12 years has been David Farber. David Farber is the owner of the Farber Law Firm and he has been there for me from the beginning of my career until now. And I would love for him to be able to help you as well. So make sure you call him at this number here and visit his website so you can learn more about the amazing David Farber of the Farber Law Firm. I had been looking for an accountant for years and I was unable to find anybody that I liked, that I worked with and was able to do what I needed to be done to my taxes and to my accountant. Jeremy David at Noble Wealth has been a godsend to me, my family and my company. We have saved so much money in taxes I can't even begin to describe and he knows what he's doing. You need to call Jeremy at Noble Wealth and get yourself the right accountant because he's the man who's going to help you save on taxes because ultimately you don't want to be making money, especially if you're self-employed and having it all go to the IRS. Call Jeremy, call Noble Wealth, and they will help you tremendously with the entire accounting process and your tax situation from A to Z. Thanks for having me. And uh, yeah, thanks for uh, making the schedule work. I think I think one of those three was actually me having to, to cancel on you. So uh, either way, uh, I'm glad that we were able to finally line it up. I like what you said, though, because it's so funny. People don't really get very upset at canceling, but I like what you said, because I kind of feel like you, where sometimes when somebody cancels, you're just like, ah, 
you're kind of relieved. It's like, okay, now I got to open, I got a gap in my schedule or I could just fit something else in. Yeah. Yeah. I normally stay like booked out like six, seven appointments a day. Uh, and so, and, and even if I don't have an appointment with somebody else, I like schedule my time. So everything, every minute's accounted for. So uh, it's nice to just have that little surprise break. Right, right, right. I think that's funny. So the reason why we're having you on, Matt, is because when I first met you, I think it was at the SVG conference a couple of years ago, I thought you had a very interesting and unique business. And that is, and I'm going to allow you to do your own introduction as well, because I definitely want to know about your business from you and your history as well. But from what I understood is you basically have developed a way uh, for contractors and, and probably public adjusters as well um, to get referrals from insurance agents. And yes, that's sir. very interesting because as someone who has, who could probably count on one hand, how many referrals I received from an insurance agent in almost 15 years of public adjusting, you actually gave me a very cool explanation and made me actually believe that it is indeed possible. So Matt, tell us a little bit about yourself and about your business, man. Yeah, sure. So I focus very narrowly on helping other roofing contractors uh, and restoration contractors create referral relationships with insurance agents. Uh, I do have a handful of public adjusters as well as uh, even a PDR guy uh, that have leveraged our training. What is PDR? In, uh, paintless dent repair for vehicles. Paint paintless dent. Are you expecting to for me to just know that what PDR is? That, is? I, I thought that was like a, a, a pretty normal thing. I don't know. I guess. I don't know. <clears> not not. for me. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, making assumptions here. So uh, at least for the viewers here, uh, paintless dent repairs with PDR. Uh, that's like one guy, kind of a unique scenario. But uh, for the most part, roofing and restoration guys, um, just teaching the stuff that I was using myself that, that allowed me to kind of explode not only the sales that I was making, but the efficiency of it and the profitability of it, uh, which I think is a lot of times a surprise to people uh, when they think about getting getting deals from a carrier, they think, okay, this is a managed repair program. This is a uh, something along those lines, uh, a preferred contractor network where we are coming out of the gate and saying, we'll take what you want to pay so long as you send us business. And um, it's really not about that. It allows us to focus in on those carriers that are going to pay more profitably, more fairly, more quickly. Um, whereas pretty much every other lead gen strategy that I'm aware of, uh, you're you're playing Russian roulette and you don't know if it's going to be a good carrier or a terrible carrier uh, until you're kind of knee deep in it. Tell us about yourself, Matt. How did you, uh, what's your, what's your background in and how, and then eventually how we got here? Yeah. So my background, uh, I grew up building houses. So, uh, kind of learned all the trades from my dad going from footers to shingles. So, I, uh, you know, was framing houses at 13, uh, installed my first, uh, roof at, at 14, did like a 60 square, uh, 10, 12 roof, uh, by myself, uh, with my dad on the ground shouting instructions because he's afraid of heights. Uh, so, uh, you know, I, I kind of got an early start and got got familiar with with the construction trades there. Um, went to college for business administration. Got out in late 2008, uh, right as it was a terrible time to get into construction, and, and so I kind of went into sales uh, for for several years and sold a bunch of different stuff. St sold door to door. Sold cars. Sold. Uh, stuff online, phone sales stuff. Uh, so I kind of learned that skill set as well. Um, then uh, as I started seeing the the construction market come back, decided to pair those things together. Um, I had the, the construction knowledge and the sales skills. Uh, and so I got into selling new builds, remodels, additions, you know, high, high end remodel stuff, doing $100,000, $200,000 kitchen remodels. Uh, doing, you know, half million dollar, you know, whole home remodel, stuff like that. Uh, and the company that I was working for uh, started getting into restoration and they started getting into roofing. And 
it just blew my mind to see instead of projects taking four months to do a remodel of someone, you know, major gut of someone's home, our projects would take like a day or two. Hmm. And, you know, and the size of them, the scope of, you know, uh, was typically smaller, right? But the margins were just as good, if not better. Uh, a lot less to go wrong. You're not having to coordinate with getting inside somebody's home every day. Um, and then when I found out that the insurance company was going to pick up like 90% of the bill, uh, I was like, this isn't sales. Like, this is ridiculous. Like, the the best metaphor I, I've come up with it is like if you were selling cars and someone came on the lot and you had a $30,000 brand new sedan and you're like, yeah, it's $3,000. It's not a matter of whether or not they want one. It's like, how many do you want? Um, and, and so, you know, when people can get that much value for the money that they're putting in, it's it's not sales anymore, uh, which is okay. Uh, but, you know, in, in going through a lot of different types of sales, I, I realized that you really have to have all the variables aligned. You have to have the volume, you have to have the profitability, you have to have the scale, uh, you know, for, to really get paid well, you have to compound those things, you know? And so, uh, roofing and restoration was where it was at for me. You know, you mentioned, you mentioned something that uh, isn't sales. I think it's funny when I first became an adjuster, I kind of thought the same thing. It's like, I'm going in and I'm going to represent you on a claim and you're going to get all this paid for and you don't have to pay out of pocket. Like my service for you, I'm not even asking for anything. I'm not asking for any money up front. And it's, I used to say the exact same thing when I first started. I'm like, it's the easiest sell. It is the easiest sell in the book because I am not, at least for me, for the roofer, you're asking for a deductible, even that, but you're getting a whole new roof for it. For me, I'm not asking for anything. I literally don't get paid unless you get paid. And I always thought that was funny because he used to always say the same thing. And someone else was saying that also, uh, who was it? I can't remember. I can't remember her name right now, but she was saying the same thing where, you know, it's really not sales because it's just such an easy sell. For what, 2,500 bucks, you're going to get a whole brand new roof. It's like, what do you got to lose? Yeah. In a lot of parts of the country, it's still a thousand bucks. Right. Uh, which is, you know, less and less these days. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> right. That's true. Um, that's, that's one uh, silver lining to inflation is that, yeah, uh, that money is, is less significant. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, you know, so. I identified roofing was, was kind of where I wanted to get into, um, started, you know, in anything I do, I just kind of get, uh, obsessed with learning it. Like, I want to understand how claims work. I want to understand how to inspect. I want to understand how to build it. I want to, you know, everything from start to finish. And so I spent a couple of years really just getting to learn the roofing industry and, everything that goes into it uh, before I had to completely rely on it for my income. Cause I was still doing the new builds, remodels, all that sort of stuff that I was already familiar with and um, switched companies, uh, you know, won't get, you know, too much into uh, that whole situation, but uh, I've been there. I've been there. I know switched companies and uh, went to a company that was just doing roofing and uh, in was, really just hustling. I was, you know, I had one kid, a brand new wife, another kid on the way and, uh, had to go out there and make money and, uh, did all the normal stuff, knocking doors, buying leads, social media, whatever I could do to try to, uh, provide for my family. And, um, I was doing, you know, kind of started off doing about a million a year working 60 hours a week, and, which is not really that, that great of a, a gig, uh, in my opinion, to, uh, you know, when you're working that much, it's dangerous, it's cold, it's you're working evenings, weekends, all that sort of stuff. Uh, it kind of sucks. And, and so I started analyzing everything that I was doing, uh, realized I had one of my buddies that was an insurance agent that was sending me some, some customers and his customers trusted him. So they trusted me. I closed them at a super high rate. He worked for, uh, it was actually a brokerage, but he represented some good carriers and consistently they would come out and pay for the roof, pay it well. You know, they're paying 550, 600 a square on their scope without me even having to, 
you know, do anything to it. And, um, you know, and if we needed to supplement for something, they were reasonable with us, you know, you give them documentation, you show them why it's needed and they go, you know, um, here's your money. And, And I realized all those things compounding, I was making about 10 times as much money for my time. It was night and day difference, but it only represented a small amount of my time. And and so that's what really got me (coughs) hooked on figuring out how to, how to scale that up and how to grow that lead source. And I had known that insurance agent for years. We went to church together. Like, you know, you can't really scale that. You can't produce 20 of those. Right. Um, So I spent a couple of years really just stubbornly meeting with insurance agents and talking with them and finding out what, what actually mattered to them and how I could deliver on those things and how I could sell them on my ability to do those things. And uh, gradually I started gaining some steam and started getting some momentum there. And and it really helped me kind of put all the pieces together to figure out, all right, if I go in and I say X, Y, Z and I do X, Y, Z, they're going to refer their customers to me and not the hundred guys that have pitched them before. And that made a massive difference for me. So um, 2019, I ended up doing almost 5 million in in roofing sales. Uh, The vast majority of that referrals from insurance agents. And, um, and then life happened. Uh, And uh, actually my ex-wife decided she was moving halfway across the country with our kid. And, uh, and it was either leave my referral network or leave my son. And so uh, obviously I chose to uh, stay with my son, moved out to, to Tennessee and left that referral network. Uh, but I started having other contractors reach out to me and they're like, hey, dude, you outsold my company of eight people. Uh, what on earth are you doing? And, uh, and I, I grew my sales that way, reducing the hours that I was working. So going from like 60 hours to like 40 hours and going on vacation all the time. Because when you make a bunch of money, you want to go spend it, Mm -hmm. right? Like, you know, it's just night and day different situation uh, for me. And and I knew um, moving out here that I would be able to repeat those results because it was kind of a, a standardized process. And when I started sharing with other contractors what I was doing, they were able to replicate that process too. And that's when the light bulb kind of went on of, you know, I need to, I need to share this with more people. There's, I could go out and sell, you know, I may be able to go sell 10 million in roofing in a year. Um, But I'm only, I only have so much capacity myself, even if I get really, really efficient at that. Um, But I can train a thousand people. I can train 10,000 people to all go do a couple extra million. And, and, you know, I only get a, a small part of, of that increased value, but I get to be, uh, you know, a small part of uh, a really big change. Um, so it's been a little over three years now that I've been training and consulting other people and, and just getting to see, you know, it's, it's cool to see the roofing companies grow and go, hey, our company did this much more. Um, but what I've, I've really just kind of become an addict at is seeing the individual salespeople going from, you know, making $80,000 a year to making $400,000 a year and their, their lives just completely transform. Um, yeah. So I know I've been talking at you for a minute. Here. So I definitely want to hear what this, uh, I want to hear the framework. Okay. I want you to get as detailed as you possibly can. All right. I know you have a course. I know you have a boot camp. You have all these things, but I want to always provide value to the audience as much as possible because let's face it. From my experience, insurance agents, at least are public adjusters, but I know roofers have somewhat of the same reputation sometimes, unfortunately. Um, they're just like, no, why? Why? We don't we don't want to refer a public adjuster. The the insurance company is gonna handle it and they're gonna they're gonna be fine. Or we don't want to refer it to a roofer because a roofer is just gonna inflate their estimate and just demand supplements left and right, and they're not gonna do what they're supposed to do ethically and blah, 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 blah. So from my experience, and I'm sure a lot of the people in the audience, uh, their experience with insurance agents, um, 
what is the framework? How is it that you, because this is a conversation again that we had and you sold me. What is it that, how do you approach an agent to try to convince him uh, of your services, to try to sell him on the idea that, you know, it is actually advantageous both to the customer and to you to use our services uh, throughout the claims process? Yeah. So uh, first of all, I'll, I'll give the caveat that Florida is more adversarial than anywhere else that I've encountered. Interesting. And so uh, I would say our process, any process of working well together is going to be more difficult in Florida than anywhere else that I've seen. That's okay. We have tougher skin. That's okay. Yeah. And I mean, there, there's, there's still tons of opportunity there. Um, but I just, I mean, that's, that's what I've seen. And, you know, what we've, you know, seen our program successful in small markets, big markets, North, South, you know, storm markets, not so much, you know, all good. Florida is just, you know how it is. It's, um, you know, everybody's uh, armed up, and, you know, and it just keeps escalating. So, uh, and, and, you know, it's hard to say um, how to, how to fix that, but uh, <laughs> I mean, honestly, we just keep grinding. That's all we do. I mean, it, it is what it is. We've got a special session actually coming this week. Uh, we're going to see how, how some of these things go, but I mean, ultimately, I mean, you got Georgia, you got Louisiana, you got a lot of other States that are actually much more difficult than even Florida uh, within yeah. the insurance claims process. Yeah. So um, in any case, really what it comes down to is uh, is creating a situation where everybody wins, like you said, where it benefits us, it benefits the customer, it benefits that insurance agent. Uh, I would say it maybe doesn't benefit the carrier in that they're going to be paying us properly, whereas somebody else they may be underpaying. Right. Um, and I'm a, I'm a, I'm totally okay with that because I think that's a just outcome. So um, the really you have to show that cus that agent the benefits to them and the benefits, of course, they're going to want you to do right by their client and do quality work and have good customer service for that, for that customer. So they're not hearing about it. You refer this contractor and now you know, they ghosted you or whatever. Uh, they need to, probably one of the biggest things is they need to be able to trust you. Right. And, and that's one of the the toughest things there is, they don't want to hand their customer over to a contractor or a public adjuster and then find out, okay, they're doing something different than what I expected. And, and the way that we handle that, honestly, is by volunteering transparency and, and going right out of the gate and saying, hey, when you refer a customer to me, we're going to be an open book and show you exactly what we're doing every step of the process. We're going to show you what our, our inspection file. So you get to see the hundreds of photos that we're taking because I can back up what I'm doing and why I'm doing it uh, with photo documentation. And, and you can include, of course, your code documentation and all that sort of stuff to go along with it. Um, but you have to, uh, of course, be able to justify what you're doing. You have to be able to back it up. Um, and not be doing shady things, right? right. <laughs> you have to be trustworthy in order yeah. to effectively prove that you are trustworthy. Um, and, and so that's one of the kind of core tenets of what we're doing is building trust. So these, these insurance agents are typically already referring somebody that somebody is just not you. Mm. Now that may not be true in the public adjuster arena, in terms of a contractor, they're typically already referring someone. The What the sale happens here is when they see a difference between one contractor and another that is tangible, where they can say, I am doing a disservice to my customer to refer them to anybody but contractor X. And so we have to get there. Uh, so those are the things that are important about servicing their client. They want us to do a good job. I mean, most agents at least want, want you to do a good job for their customer. Um, what they care about most is their own pocketbooks. And that's not any slight on them. That's just the way people work, right? Uh, 
and, and they want to have both. So you need to check those boxes for their customers. But if you can make a compelling case that you are going to help this agent retain their client and continue to get renewals year in, year out off of this person, then that is a reason that they need to refer you. And this is especially true for public adjusters is if they see you as an adversary, which is typically what happens is that PA comes in, doesn't know the insurance agent and is bad mouthing the carrier, bad mouthing the agent. Uh, and I'm not saying you do that, but that's happens quite a bit. Right. Uh, and, you know, in telling this customer, Hey, we're going to handle this. And then you need to go shopping somewhere else. Uh, and, and so that, that customer's gone and the, the commission that that agent makes every year on them is gone. Then agents know their numbers in, in this regard. And so they are looking at, okay, it may be 15% of their customers that they lose every year because they pass away, they move out of state where they don't provide coverage, whatever, they go to another carrier, whatever. And so if you can let them know that you are going to have their back, you're going to be their ally. You're going to say, hey, you know, even if the carrier is being difficult, we're going to work through this. And I know that this agent is going to advocate for you. They're going to help us get a hold of a the, the adjuster's boss's boss to get this stuff pushed through, to get this stuff taken care of. You can make them the hero. So that customer goes, I'm not going anywhere. When I had, when I had a claim and I was getting denied, my, my agent connected me up with Vince Perry, this public adjuster. And he helped me get this thing taken care of. I'm sticking with this agent because I know he's got my best interest in mind. Right. 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 Um, with a, in terms of a public adjuster, I highly recommend going after brokers over captive agents. And I agree. The, the specific reason for that, one, most brokers started as captive agents, got tired of screwing over their customers, right? And, and went to the brokerage model because they can offer them options. Uh, but they also have a split fiduciary duty. So this is something that like blew my mind uh, is that captive agents, their only fiduciary duty is to the carrier. A one carrier. That, to, yeah, to, well, to the carrier that they work for. Right. And, which means they need to make sure they're not sliding somebody's application past the carrier that they know is, you know, there's other risk factors there. Uh, they need to look out for the carrier. And that's a good thing that, you know, insurance doesn't work if you don't have that element there. Um, they don't have any fiduciary duty to do right by that customer. So they can sell that customer a policy that they know is not going to provide them the coverage that they actually need. They can sell them the policy that they know they're never going to use because they can't afford the deductible that they've just burdened them with. They can do those things. So a, a broker, however, has that split fiduciary duty where they have to look out for the interest of the carrier and for their customer. And, and so they can refer that public adjuster knowing, hey, this is you know, maybe going to cost the carrier a little bit of money, but it's going to be the right thing. And it's going to take care of this customer. I know if this customer just drops their claim when they have a valid claim, they're not being done right. And as the expert, I need to be able to, the one to advise them and consult them on that. Interesting. That yeah, that makes sense. So that to me is the second most important thing that these insurance agents want from you. The most important thing, and I usually ask my customers this as a question, like, hey, what's, if those are all the, you know, those are important things, what is the most important thing? What's going to really make this insurance agent refer you is new business. And, you know, they're sale, these agents are salespeople, right? They usually even hire people to do the customer service aspect. They're not doing the adjusting. They are, they are purely sales. Right. More so, more so than a roofing salesperson as a salesperson. Um, that's all that they are doing. And if you can not only help them keep the customers that they have, but you can bring them new business, you win. You are, you know, they know they're going to be losing some customers. They need to replace them somehow. Ultimately, that's what I always say. The first thing when you're networking and you're meeting contractors and agents, whoever it is, try to pass the first, try to pass the first referral. I mean, if you're able to pass referrals first, you're almost guaranteed to start getting referrals back. Now it's easier said than done, but yeah, I completely agree with you. 
I mean, you're if you're able to start referring them. And the beauty about your system and about talking to agents is we're in front of we're in front of insureds all the time. And chances are they're not Oftentimes very they're happy. Right. Yeah, because they're uh, they've got an open claim, so they're probably not very happy. So we could refer them on almost every one of our jobs. Yeah, and I think you you mentioned something you know easier said than done. If you are intentional about it, it really isn't that hard. And so, like one of the kind of core things that we focus on is is delivering on that. So we've got to sell them on the fact that we can bring them business. If you're talking to, if you're intentional about the conversations you have with every one of your clients and you do that consistently and you're not only identifying, but you're capitalizing every time there's that opportunity, because I'm sure uh, you're probably the same as I, I was where, you know, a lot of times, you know, that customer's pissed off at their, their carrier, they're going to leave and, and you go, okay, yeah, cool. Go to Google, whatever. Right. And like, you didn't get anything out of the value in that opportunity because you just let it go. Right. If you are locked and loaded, ready to refer them, ready to do that in a way that's compelling to them, uh, that's convincing to them where they go, hey, there's something in this for me. Worst case scenario, I stick with who I've got, uh, but I can probably improve my situation, either save money or get better coverage, sometimes even both. I'm going. Yep. Yep. And it's as simple as engineering your processes to deliver that opportunity on a consistent basis. And now you've got the, the currency that, that these insurance agents want from you. And how do you go about finding these agents? Like it's a, what, what's, what's your first step? Where, where are they, where are they easy to find Is Are we talking networking events? Are we talking LinkedIn? Are we talking, you know, what do you, what do you suggest? Yeah. So, uh, I'm not a big fan of networking events. I used to go to a bunch of them when I was young and single and didn't have a bunch of kids. Um, you know, now it's like, Hey, come to our, you know, networking event from six to eight. And I'm like, no, no. <laughs> um, I haven't dinner with my family and put my kids to bed. Um, but uh, anyway, that that's, you know, kind of my own personal preference. Uh, insurance agents are exceptionally easy to find. You can go to a carrier's website. Every single one of them that I've ever seen has a find an agent button on it. Ah. And there's a list of 50 people that work for that insurance carrier that you like working with. Um, you can go to Google and search for homeowner, homeowners insurance agents near me. Ah. There's a list of 42,000 of them. Um, if you, My kind of rule of thumb, if you cannot find them on the internet, they don't have anyone to refer to you. That's true too. Uh, so yeah, it, it's it's really not hard to find them. Um, you know, once you get in with some agents, you can even start kind of networking from one agent to another. Uh, that's really helpful when you're when you're doing both residential and commercial, and you can take that residential agent that you're you've been killing it for, and, uh, and find their commercial counterpart and get an introduction um, to them. That's awesome. And tell me about this referral system bootcamp that you've got going on and you're, how you're able to, to sort of teach everything that you're telling us to, to others. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I started off uh, doing my training literally through Zoom calls and I would get on about three, two hour long Zoom calls a day and just <laughs> regurgitate the same stuff over and over and over again uh, until my brain was fried. <laughs> and, uh, and then I got smart and recorded like an online university. Um, we've, we've gone through and redone that and done really high production value, good audio, video, all that sort of stuff. We're actually getting ready to redo that again here in January. Um, and, and I would support that with some live calls and that sort of th stuff. Uh, but I, I had clients that wanted to work with me directly, wanted that direct feedback where they can make a, a phone call or they can do a ro you know, role play through a situation and I can in the moment go, Hey, change your tone here. Don't forget to say this, you know, make some fast improvements, uh, through that, that process. And, and so we started doing some boot camps, started doing some live events. Uh, I do work with people, you know, if they've got a big office, they want me to fly out there, do a day or three or whatever, we can do that type of stuff. But 
for a lot of people, they're small shops. They've only got a couple of people and it makes a lot more sense to uh, just come to that boot camp. So we do, it's kind of a unique style, I think, in the way that we train. We kind of go through and explain why we're doing what we're doing. We go through and really get into the details of the concept. Uh, but every one of the things we're role playing through it. Uh, and, you know, with like calls that we make to insurance agents and schedule meetings with them, uh, we always do those like role plays. We do some on stage, we have people role play that conversation, and then we do live calls. And so I'll have people on stage, cameras pointed at them, you know, on a microphone calling insurance agents. Uh, and, wow. you know, and, uh, which is a little bit of pressure, uh, but they, they go back from that and making a call alone with nobody listening to you is super easy now after doing that. Uh, but you also get to see, Hey, that guy, you know, is not any smarter than me. And he just called that agent and it worked. And, you know, and we, you know, consistently uh, get 70, 80% of those agents to schedule a meeting with us in those meetings we're pretty consistently north of 50% at actually converting that agent into somebody that's going to refer us business. So wow. it, it was, it's very targeted. It's not, you know, kind of the, the old school method was driving all over town, dropping off donuts to 57 different in, insurance agents and hoping that a couple of them, you know, happen to throw a bone your way, um, which somehow s- still seems to be profitable, but it's not, <laughs> not ideal. Right. Um, so that is, um, yeah, that's, that's kind of how we go about it. So the, the boot camp events are not something that's required, but, uh, the guys that come out of that and gals, uh, just absolutely crush it. We had actually one woman, uh, at our boot camp, and she just blew all the guys away and did uh, scheduled 12 meetings with insurance agents in about 45 minutes. Holy crap. Yeah. Um, Let's go through a role play. Okay. How does that usually go? So I guess I should play the agent, right? Uh, yeah. So there's, uh, you know, some different role play that we'll do as a, just depending on the context. So if we were, for instance, doing this as a, we, we cold called the insurance agent. Um, really, you have to understand that context and to know what we're doing in this meeting. Uh, when I cold call an insurance agent, the most important thing I'm going to focus on is the fact that I have people that I can refer to them. So if okay. we're doing the context. I'm a public adjuster yeah. and I'm calling that insurance agent. I'm going to say something like, Hey Vince, this is Matt with XYZ roofing uh, or uh, sorry, public XYZ, adjusters. Public adjusting. Yeah. Uh, XYZ public adjusting. Uh, the reason I'm calling you is because of the processes in our business. We get a ton of opportunities to refer our clients to agents that we work with. The only problem that I have right now is that I don't really have a good agent that I can refer those customers to over in the Cape Coral area. Now, I've been doing some research online, saw a lot of reviews about you guys. Uh, seems like you guys are really have an upstanding business. I wanted to see if I can sit down with you, learn a little bit more about what you do, and see if you would be a good fit for those, those clients. Do you have some time here available on Wednesday or Thursday? Yeah, but I don't know. I've been hearing a lot of things, reading a lot of different things with public adjusters. And frankly, the last public adjuster I referred to really dropped the ball on the entire claim. And it was almost just, there was no point uh, in, in me going. And uh, the, the the client was very upset the way the public adjuster handled it. And I thought they would have just been better off using the insurance company by themselves. I am sorry to hear that. And I know uh, public adjusters kind of get a bad rap because there are some bad apples out there. Um you know, I can talk to you about what we do as public adjusters, uh, but really the the purpose of this meeting here is that um, the customers that I'm already dealing with that we're getting claims handled for um, are a lot of times looking for a new carrier and looking for a new agent who is going to advocate for them, who is going to put them in a policy that covers them. Is that would you say that it would fit what you guys are doing, or should I maybe? Call somebody else. <laughs> I'm starting to see some dollar signs, Matt. Now I see, I see what you're getting at here. I see, I see some dollar signs. And also, just to get out of the role play real quick, uh, people are finding it harder to find insurance. So another 
sort of pitch that a public adjuster can say is, look, I have this client and they're getting dropped. That happens a lot too, is in the middle of the claim, they're getting dropped or they're obviously their rates are, are going up. And, and yeah, yeah, as a salesman myself, you're, you're speaking like music to my ears right now. It's like, Oh wait, you've got people really, you've got how many you got, but how many? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And we kind of refocus. This isn't about you sending your customers to me as a public adjuster and we'll get, we'll get around to that. in our Sure. Meeting. This yeah. is about, we need to schedule this meeting and, uh, and it, you legitimately need to have customers that you want to refer to a good agent who's going to put them in a good policy, who's going to advocate for them if, if they're getting uh, railroaded by their insurance carrier. I think it's interesting. I think it's unique because we get that all the time. You know, we get clients all the time who are looking for insurance and, you know, we're constantly trying to build relationships with contractors. And I remember the first time I met you, it was just like, wait a minute, let's, I like things that are different anyway, right? It's people tell me to go this way. I want to go this way. So if nobody's going to the agents, I mean, it seems like this is the place to go. And all of us as public adjusters should have at least 10 people, 10 clients that we could think of off the top of our head who has told us in the last few months that they need insurance. It's all, it happens all the time. On top of that, we have people who, uh, who want, us to review their policies that they're being sold. That happens all the time too. Hey, this agent is giving me this policy. What do you think? So, I mean, I don't see why more public adjusters don't have agents that they could refer to. Now, obviously the more the merrier, but do you have like, do you, do you have like a system of like having a being dedicated to a, a, a an agent over here and then being dedicated to an agent over there and, and trying to find like your favorites. You have like a system for that. You know, I think, uh, one, I want to focus on good carriers, right. And as a public adjuster or contractor, you should kind of know who, who qualifies as a good carrier in your, they all suck. <laughs> There's a spectrum. The can least, we, least, the least suck. least agree on that? Uh, least sucky. The least sucky. And as public adjusters, you probably deal with the, the worst ones more often. Mm -hmm. The good ones uh, just come out and stroke a check and everybody's kind of happy. Mm, yeah. It doesn't uh, happen nowadays. Not anymore. Right. Yeah. Uh, and that's one of those things with, with Florida, right. Uh, where there are a lot of markets where, uh, you know, guys would say, yeah, the companies come, you know, these good companies come out and they stroke a fat check for it. And we're, we're off to the races, uh, because of that adversarial nature, it, it's, it's tougher in Florida to find those good carriers. Uh, cause if you're paying out more liberally, you're, you're going under, yeah, uh, in yeah. Florida. <laughs> pretty much, uh, you know, so, um, uh, but anyway, the, you know, there, there's kind of that spectrum of, of bad to better. Um, that, that you can focus on, on those carriers. So if you can focus on those good carriers, and then when we go into that meeting, really the focus is on interviewing them and learning about them and finding out, you can learn a lot about insurance agents, just asking about, uh, you know, how long they've been an agent, what carriers they've worked for. Uh, you know, they're going to tell you things, like I said, like I mentioned before, yeah, I started off working for XYZ carrier, this captive, you know, they recruited me, you know, shortly after college and then found out that they were just screwing over their customers. And so I came over here to this other carrier that I think is better. Okay, cool. Well, you're at least telling me that your mindset is aligned with like taking care of your customers. Right. And, and that your carrier needs to be paying out claims and uh, things like that. Um, you can ask them about difficulties that they've had in the past with public adjusters. You can ask them about maybe successful times that they've used public adjusters. Uh, same goes for contractors, of course. And, and so that's going to uh, give give you a roadmap of what are their what are their buttons here that I need to make sure I'm pushing. Right. They say, oh, yeah, you know, uh, I had this public adjuster. They took care of the customer or whatever, but they wouldn't communicate. Cool. I need to let them know how I communicate, how we solve that problem. Right. Uh, to make sure, you know, we don't have issues. Uh, you know, hey, the public adjuster was fair, but it took forever. Hey, we've got this process in place to make sure that claims are moving forward as quickly as they can, right? Um, that you know, that is kind of 
part of the hack of in that meeting, how you're building value and you're uh, showing them that you're capable of doing all these things for their customer. Um, but really you have to start off with learning about them, learning about what makes them tick, what's important to them um, for you to do that well. And is this all you're doing now, Matt? Are you still in roofing at all? Or is this pretty much your 100% all in, in this, in, uh, in the service that you're providing now and the product that Uh, you're selling? Yeah. So I still, uh, my hobby is still, uh, doing some, uh, large loss, uh, building consulting. So if your your network of public adjusters, uh, wants to hire me to go, uh, look at some claims, some roof claims, typically, um, I'm not your guy for flood and fire, um, that sort of deal. Um, I am available for that sort of thing. Um, but, uh, yeah, I stopped selling and building roofs. I tried to do both for uh, a few months and, and realized I was going to let, let somebody down. And, yeah. uh, fortunately we've really found, um, uh, found a lot of contractors that can benefit from what we're doing. Um, so it's, uh, it's taken off. So we've got an office employees, you know, whole, whole production here. One thing I always like to ask my guests, cause uh, you know, uh, the people who come on the show are, are just very entrepreneurs, visionaries, and they're really looking to grow. Where do you see yourself and where do you see this company in the next five years? Uh, man, I think, uh, we are, uh, I've actually got a phone call after we get done with this podcast, uh, talking with, uh, someone else that, you know, uh, about how we can kind of expand our training offering. And, uh, and I, I really don't want to focus on, you know, I don't want to be the one-stop shop for, um, everything in terms of like Matt Danskin teaching you. Uh, I, I have things that I, I believe I'm an expert at that I'm, you know, in my, my narrow little lane, I don't know anybody else that, that can keep up with us. Uh, but I want to be able to bring some of the lessons that we've learned about uh, teaching so that people can learn. Uh, I want to be able to, you know, take some of the things that we've learned and the capabilities we have in production value uh, to really bring a lot more resources to the restoration and roofing industry. Um, speaking of which, I mean, we're just about wrapped up with our marketing course that we have that we're going to start providing in 2023 here, man. I'd love to have you on that course if you're interested. Yeah. I'm always down to talk about stuff like that. Yeah. We're going to, we do our, our, our course. We're going to put, we're going to implement it next year. Like we have our claims course, which is a two day sort of like boot camp type thing on Zoom, where the first day is just all basically me training on on marketing and how to really grow your public adjusting business. And then day two, I have I have like uh, experts. I think it'd be cool to have you on and, and just teach them. And then we also have the online portal. So I don't know if that's, I mean, we got to talk about that. I'm down. Let's talk about it. Yeah, man. Yeah, let's do that. All right, Matt, dude, thank you so much for coming on. I did want to ask you, what's your favorite book back there? I love the little stack of books you got. What's uh, what's I can't see the titles. So, but what's one that you uh that you like in particular? Um, book reader myself. You know, I it's uh, I've got a different book for every scenario or situation or or little thing. Uh, I would say, uh, let me. Let me identify one that your audience may uh, especially um, benefit from. I think you have pay up there. I do uh, have pay up. Yeah, that's, uh, you know, Merlin. kind of re- required learning uh, or required reading for a, uh, a public adjuster, right? Um, what stands out? I would say um, start with why. Oh, you know, I have that, like, uh, I haven't, I haven't, uh, I started that one. I haven't really gone through it because he's got like three of them, right? Yeah. He's got to start with why he's got, uh, I think the follow-up book to yeah, like, there's like three of them. I, know why. Uh, yep. I think I've got that lent out right now. Um, yeah. Simon Sinek has a bunch of books actually, I think, but, uh, it, it's really just helpful understanding at the core of why you're doing what you're doing. And sure. it's really easy to fall into the trap 
I think career wise of going, Oh yeah, I saw this other guy was a public adjuster and it seemed like a good, you know, good job for him. So I'm going to go do that without really examining why the heck am I doing this? And yeah. Um, you know, so that start with why that finding your why uh, I think can be really helpful for anybody uh, is one that I read here recently. I agree. I agree. It makes things a little bit more. Yeah. You, you have more passion. You get more passion behind it, more reason uh, for, for the amount of work that we do. Cause I know I'm sure you're like me as you start early, you end late and, and just keep it going. But I, I love it personally. I think it's great, but Matt, thank you so much, man, for coming on. I really do appreciate you taking the time. I know you are a busy man. Hopefully we get to see each other soon and let's talk about the, uh, the marketing course. I'd love to have you on, man. I'm putting you okay. on the spot. That's you right. No, I'm, you can't say no. <laughs> right. Yeah. Look like a jerk on your show. Uh, no, it's uh, uh, definitely something interested. Uh, I'd be interested in. Cool. All right, Matt. Thanks a lot, man. We'll see you around. All right. Thanks, Vince.